Coming up next on Carib Nation, a conversation with another outstanding woman of the Caribbean, Wilma A. Lewis, former U.S. Attorney for the District of Columbia. You're watching Carib Nation Television. Hello, welcome to Carib Nation. I'm Doris Dean. In our continuing efforts to bring you information about people who are making substantial contributions to the community, we bring you another of the outstanding women of the Caribbean, Wilma A. Lewis, former U.S. Attorney for the District of Columbia. Welcome to Carib Nation. Thanks very much for joining us. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, as I, we've had the pleasure before of talking with uh, the first Caribbean person who served as U.S. Attorney for the District of Columbia, mm -hmm. and you had the distinction of being the first woman. Yes, that's correct. Uh, that's a great uh, source of pride to the Caribbean, as I'm sure you know. Tell us, where are you from, and uh, what kind of family did you grow up in? I am from St. Thomas, Virgin Islands. I was actually born in Puerto Rico, but uh, consider myself a Virgin Islander because I've always lived in the Virgin Islands. I grew up in the Virgin Islands and grew up in a very warm, supportive, loving, encouraging family. Um, parents who took a lot of time with my brother, who's three years older than I am, and mm -hmm. with me. Um, spent a lot of quality time with us, breakfast, lunch, mm. dinner, and things of that sort. So parents who I looked up to a great deal, learned a, quite a bit from, and was always encouraged by. Mm -hmm. As we all know, in the Caribbean, education is the main focus of our parents. They want us to be doctors, lawyers, etc. You have obviously followed in the right direction. Did you have any particular pressure to go into one of those fields, as we say, to be able to work for yourself? I didn't have pressure um, to go into any particular field. I think my dad in particular I uh, was very happy when I decided that I thought I wanted to be a lawyer because I, I think that was his lifelong dream. He did not have the opportunity. So I think he was quite happy when one of his children mm -hmm. decided to go into law. But I remember always being encouraged by my parents in particular to be the best that I could be, do always put my best foot forward. And they weren't really pushing any particular profession. Mm -hmm. Just, which gave just, me a lot of leeway, of course. but gave me the necessary encouragement that I needed mm -hmm. to really go out and do the best that I could, whatever profession I happened to mm -hmm. choose. What did your parents do? My uh, dad was uh, with the Postal Service. He retired after over uh, 40 years of service. Uh, he was a supervisor of mails and delivery uh, for the post office, and my mom was with the Customs Service. Mm -hmm. She retired after about 30 years of service, and she retired as the Assistant District Director of Customs for the Virgin Islands. So both federal government employees, mm -hmm. uh, both public servants, and I think that certainly had quite an impact on me in right, terms yeah. of my desire at some point in my career to devote it to public service. Mm -hmm. And that's the, you, they moved right up through the ranks also. Yes, indeed. Um, and that was important for me as well because, mm -hmm. in particular, it's my mom who started as a GS, I believe, GS2 payroll mm -hmm. clerk in the Customs Service. She worked her way through mm -hmm. the ranks and ended up being the second in command mm -hmm. um, in the Virgin Islands in the mm -hmm. Customs Service. So it certainly showed me that as a woman, she could take care of her family, um, be a very quality mother, spend mm -hmm. quality time with her children, and at the same time be very uh, productive um, and lead a, a very constructive uh, career mm -hmm. in, the, in the federal service and work her way up to the top. Yeah, that's a very strong message to send today. Uh, we hear so much about parents who feel they cannot do both or parents who feel that they have to put more into their career mm -hmm. and very often the family goes by the wayside. Mm -hmm. And it takes some doing 
What do you think was the one thing that gave your parents, or your mother especially, that edge? What was it that she did extra or didn't have to do in order to succeed at that? Well, you know, as I, I reflect on it, I always think of my mom. They call them the super moms today. Mm -hmm. And I think of her as a super mom back in her time. Um, I think that she had, um, one, the determination to do all of these things, and two, a supportive husband mm. right at her That's side. From the very beginning, yeah. Every step of the way. They are a team. Mm -hmm. um, they are inseparable. They do everything together. Um, they were working together both at their careers and their and family. The family. Um, in addition to that, my parents owned two general merchandise stores. So in addition to working mm -hmm. during the day with the federal wow. government, in addition to taking care of the family and spending quality time with us, they had these two stores wow. that we contributed to as well. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, uh, they ran a guest house. My goodness. Um, so I really think of my mother, Real my parents, as the super parents yes. um, who did it all and did it all very, very, very well. well. And I think yeah. that was always a source of, of great inspiration for me to just mm -hmm. see them. They were my role models. I did not have to look beyond the four corners of my house right. to find the role models because they did it all and they did it well. Yes, I'm sure. Well, with that, you obviously went on to do very well yourself. Thank you. Uh, having graduated from Harvard. Yes. And, uh, uh, having risen to the highest position in the district. Tell us a little bit about your journey there. Mm -hmm. um, what brought you to the United States and how did you go about setting your pattern, setting your path? Mm -hmm. I uh, graduated uh, from high school in St. Thomas and I came first to the United States to attend college. I attended Swarthmore College which is in Swarthmore, Pennsylvania, just outside mm -hmm. of Philadelphia. And after Swarthmore, I attended Harvard Law School, as you indicated, and came down to D.C. from Harvard. I had worked at a law firm the summer after my second year of law school here in the district. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was the trial summer to mm -hmm. see whether, one, I liked the firm, practice, and two, to see whether I liked the District of Columbia. Mm -hmm. um, decided I liked both and so came back uh, after I graduated from uh, Harvard to practice here. And I've actually practiced here my entire professional career. So wow. it, this year will be uh, 20 years yeah. um, that I've been uh, here in the district uh, practicing uh, mm -hmm. law. Uh, the path was not defined, if you will, mm -hmm. in a particular way. Um, there was one thing that I knew I wanted to do. And that was that at some point in my career, I wanted to go into public service. Mm -hmm. I didn't define when that would be. I didn't define how long I would be in public service. But I knew that that's something that I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. I started out in the private sector. And then when I got the itch for the public service, I went into public service and then have been in public service for the past 15 years. Mm -hmm. And as you know, now with the change in administration, right. um, left uh, the position of United States Attorney, and I'm now a partner at the uh, law firm Crowell and Mooring here in the district. Mm -hmm. now, that's a quite a large uh, law firm also in the district. A law firm of about 250 lawyers uh, headquartered here in the district with uh, branch offices in Irvine, California, mm -hmm. uh, in Brussels, and in, uh, and in London. Mm -hmm. When America wants to know what's happening in the Caribbean diaspora, there is one clear choice. Hello, welcome to Carib Nation. Both people inside and outside are very excited about today's program. Looking at you, I can tell that you have traveled the journey. <laughs> one television organization brings America close to the people, stories and events that affects Caribbean life. Get close, get answers, get Carib Nation. When you became, when you joined the District of Columbia, uh, Eric Holder was there. Did he tell you anything? Did he give you any tips, or did he he warn you about anything in particular as you went into that job? Not particular warnings, if you will. He certainly gave me a description of the job, mm -hmm. of what it entailed. And uh, Eric uh, has always been a great friend. Mm. Uh, I respect him so much, both professionally and personally, yes. and consider him a friend. 
and I always knew that he was only a phone call away, mm -hmm. um, which was a comforting thought uh, to know that there was somebody there who had been in the position before that if I had an issue or a problem or needed some advice on a matter, I could certainly call him. Mm -hmm. um, but at the outset, he basically told me what the, the, the job entailed, if you will. Yeah. So that gave me a sense of uh, what I was getting into. What you were into. really getting into. Right. Right. And there were a number of issues uh, in the district mm -hmm. that you had to face. Mm -hmm. um, we had mm -hmm. gun control, sure. um, and there's a number of uh, violence against women, yes. abuse, and uh, what did you find the most challenging part of your job? I think the most challenging part of the job was making sure that our priorities that we set were reflective of the needs of the community. Uh, in any of these agencies, uh, you're always doing battle between the things that you would like to get done and the resources that you have to do them. Mm. And so there's always a challenge in terms of establishing priorities. Mm -hmm. But beyond establishing priorities, I thought it was very important to make sure those priorities that we set really reflected the needs of the community and were responsive to the needs of the community. Mm. We have a very or a broad mission in the United States Attorney's Office because unlike any other office, U.S. Attorney's Office in the country, we are responsible for both federal and local prosecutions. Mm -hmm. We serve as a federal prosecutor and we serve as a local DA or district attorney right. with respect to the prosecution of um, adults for all the crimes from misdemeanors all the way up to major felonies such as mm -hmm. homicides. Uh, so the, the, the mission is very broad. We also have a civil division, of course, that handles mm -hmm. uh, civil matters defending the agencies of the federal government. The mission is extremely broad mm -hmm. and we have to make sure that we are devoting our resources in such a way that we are really responding to the needs of mm -hmm. the community. What would you say uh, was the greatest need as you came into the District of Columbia, and how do you believe you were able to satisfy that need, or how do you uh, rank the success that you were able to achieve in, f in view of what you had to deal with? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, I can answer that question by addressing it from, I think, two perspectives. I think there was a, a great need to um, develop partnerships um, between the United States Attorney's Office, uh, the community, and other entities both within and outside of the law enforcement community. Mm -hmm. One of the major uh, programs that we developed during my tenure was a community prosecution program. Eric Holder mm -hmm. had started it as a pilot program before me and I expanded it to the entire city. He started as a pilot in one of the districts, the mm -hmm. fifth district, I expanded it to the rest of the city. And the essence of that was that we have prosecutors who are paired with geographic areas within the community. So they're working on crimes that happen in particular districts and further in particular patrol service areas. They get to know the community. Uh -huh. They go to community meetings. We really are able to establish um, a better rapport with and relationship with and partnership with the community, mm -hmm. um, which is an important part of the law enforcement effort. Um, we were able to be more proactive, we were able to get better intelligence, we were able to focus our initiatives more on the specific crimes occurring in that particular neighborhood. Mm -hmm. um, and we were able to form a stronger partnership with the Metropolitan Police Department because you had the same prosecutors working with the same right. officers yes. in the same area. Um, we developed partnerships with other city government agencies. So that was the essence of the approach that we used during my tenure, a partnership type approach, and I think it really inured to our benefit. Mm -hmm. From the substantive perspective, um, I think that uh, violent crime is always um, uh, at the, the top of the list, the list, among the top issues of concern um, here in the district. And we, uh, in order to address the violent crime, we did, we did uh, several things, one of which was to develop a gang prosecution unit to deal with the gangs in the District of Columbia. Mm -hmm. And that unit has been very, very successful, trying or prosecuting about five major gangs in the district 
uh, since the spring of 1999. Mm -hmm. um, in addition to that, we developed a gun violence reduction program, Operation Ceasefire. Mm -hmm. That was a comprehensive program designed to try to get guns off the street, right. be tougher on the prosecution of guns, and also, there were, importantly, there was a prevention component, which I was also very big on during my tenure, working to try to to, to turn kids in the right direction. So we had a, we developed a school program where the prosecutors uh, would go into the schools and talk to the kids mm -hmm. about guns and the hazards of gun violence. Mm -hmm. um, hopefully uh, uh, setting before them role models and directions and choices mm -hmm. that they could right. deal with. Um, so we focused on those two areas, the guns, um, the violence, uh, um, uh, wreaked by the, by the gangs in the district um, as ways of addressing or helping to address the violent crime mm -hmm. and the gun problem that we have in the District of Columbia. So mm -hmm. those are some of the major initiatives that we launched uh, during the tenure. Mm -hmm. uh, drug abuse and racial, racial profiling mm -hmm. are also two things that seem to rest heavily on the shoulders of the District Attorney's Office. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you see as the answer, if there is an answer, for racial profiling? Uh, there's a, a lot of talk now. Um, Eleanor Holmes Norton is working to uh, set up a, a bill, get that through Congress, and um, to, to capitalize on this administration's promise mm -hmm. that they will stamp out racial profiling. But there's some people who believe that it's that a lot of it is is so inherent in the police department and in people that this is a long haul and uh, they're not sure really if they can conquer this what is what is your view on that well you know i <clears throat> i'm the eternal optimist <laughs> and uh, i have faith that um, we can do better than um, is the case right now because you obviously hear of of cases of, of this happening in various places uh, throughout our country. Um, I think it's going to have to be a combination of, of, um, of, of laws that uh, insist upon strict accountability and checking of what's going on in law enforcement and the stops that are being made and things of that sort, together with a culture change. And that's, 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 the, the, that's the harder part that you, you alluded to. Because um, when you talk about issues that deal with, with, with race and racial profiling, um, it's issues that often are very deep-seated. Mm -hmm. um, and so there is a culture change that needs to be um, instilled mm -hmm. in, in, in the law enforcement uh, um, throughout the country to make sure it is clear okay. um, what it is we are supposed to be about and what it is we're not supposed to be about. So I think that there's going to have to be continuous training and education and more training and more education and more and more follow-up in this area mm -hmm. um, to make sure that not only those who are already within the law enforcement ranks, but those who are coming into the law enforcement ranks right. understand what the culture has to be. Mm -hmm. When America wants to know what's happening in the Caribbean diaspora, there is one clear choice. Hello, welcome to Carib Nation. Both people inside and outside are very excited about today's program. Looking at you, I can tell that you have traveled the journey. <laughs> one television organization brings America close to the people, stories and events that affects Caribbean life. Get close, get answers, get Carib Nation. One of the other issues that seems to be hanging over people's heads in the District of Columbia, education. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're hearing a lot of crime in schools. Uh, we've lost a number of young people in schools. Metal detectors may or may not be working. Mm -hmm. And that is another area that we wonder what does the U.S. District Attorney's Office feel about how do you teach these children certain values when you have to frisk everyone and you have to have metal detectors, guards outside the door? 
what is what is the answer there? You know, it's. I think if I had the answer, I'd probably be a millionaire. It's one of those sixty-four <laughs> million dollar questions, um, and and it's quite clear that uh, we live in 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 some very challenging times, and that's one of the very challenging issues. It's 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 an issue, obviously, not only here in D.C. but throughout the country, because we mm -hmm. hear of these cases um, and uh, that have occurred in which. Uh, 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 children are taking guns to school and uh, and, and and using those guns. Um, I, I think that we are all, not only in law enforcement, but throughout our communities, going to have to pay more and more attention to our children. Um, there are some who are fortunate to have a strong family background, mm -hmm. um, and uh, so they are pretty much taken care of in terms of the values and the principles and the mores and those right. kinds of things and the direction because they have a strong home life. Unfortunately, there are many, many children who are not quite as fortunate as that and don't have that strong home life. And I think it becomes, um, whether we like it or not, everybody's responsibility in the community um, to try to do a little bit mm -hmm. to help that situation. In the U.S. Attorney's Office, uh, we devoted, as I mentioned to you earlier, a fair amount of time to prevention mm -hmm. efforts mm -hmm. um, focused on the youth of the District of Columbia. Mm -hmm. I mentioned in the context of Operation Ceasefire, the prosecutors mm -hmm. going into schools. Another program that we had was called the DEFI program, Drug Education for Youth. Uh -huh. um, which was um, attached to our Weed and Seed initiative, which is a Department of Justice initiative that focuses not only on effective and strong law enforcement, but seeding, which is a weed part, but seeding the community, rehabilitation, um, revitalization of community, with the community groups playing an active role in developing yeah. and enhancing their communities. The DeFi program was a, uh, a, a a camp that we had in the summer months, a, a week-long camp, and then there was a year-long mentor program mm -hmm. attached to that. So we stayed with the kids, kids between ages 9 and 12. Um, and we not only had allowed them to have fun at the camp, but we had them in the classroom as I well, see. talking about drugs and talking about guns and talking about conflict resolutions and talking about how to say no and, and talking about peer pressure and things of that sort. Mm -hmm. Um, I think those are the types of things that we're going to have to do more and more yeah, of, right. um, not only in the government or in the U.S. Attorney's Office, um, but in the private sector as well. You know, adoption of schools. We, mm -hmm. have an, we had an adoption of school program with Amadon Elementary School in Southwest Washington, where we, you know, supported the school programs and went in and mentored and tutored the kids. More and more of that, I think, needs to be done so that we end up with the great overwhelming majority of the kids in the right direction and the distinct minority being the ones who are the troublesome kids. So that you can get a better hand on That's exactly the right. Groups. We want the, the, the kids who are, are heading in the right direction to be the ones leading the, and, uh, leading the effort and the ones running the streets mm -hmm. um, so that they can say, this is our community and no, we're not going to do drugs and no, we're not going to do guns and they will be the ones who are the uh, Ones who to be dealt helping, with. Yeah. Um, marijuana mm -hmm. as uh, medicinal benefit, so to speak. We've just had the ruling mm -hmm. by the Supreme Court. There's some people who are still upset, who are still angry that a person who is dying and this is their last chance could be put in jail. Mm -hmm. uh, there are other people who are obviously also very upset that. We're filling the jails with people who are sick, who are addicted to drugs, and may not be criminals. Mm -hmm. Is there any chance for turning that around so that there is some opportunity to work with these people on a more humanitarian basis and, and help ill people? because? The, the, the demand for drugs is not going away, and the source is constantly there to feed it. And the source will always be there as long as the demand is there. Unless these people are cured, that demand will continue. And mm -hmm. there are many people who are very upset that mm -hmm. the, the law doesn't seem to see this. Mm -hmm. 
What is the answer there? Well, you know, I think that uh, there are programs, and we need more of them, uh, that address uh, the treatment um, mm -hmm. of people who are, have drug problems. Um, I'll give you an example here in the District of Columbia. We have a drug court program. Mm -hmm. So uh, somebody who is a um, first-time offender who comes in and um, has a, is arrested and, and, and charged with um, a drug offense, um, nonviolent drug offense, um, is able to go into this drug court program mm -hmm. where the essence, the focus of it is on getting them the kind of treatment and hopefully discipline that they need to stay away from drugs. So there is that effort even after they are arrested um, on the first time to try to give them the kind of treatment that hopefully um, will point them in the right direction and keep them away from drugs in the future. Mm -hmm. um, there clearly is a need, and I don't think anybody would debate the fact that there is a need for um, more drug treatment programs mm -hmm. because we need to do a better job of treating those who um, are addicted to drugs. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I think on the other hand as well, however, that the law needs to be there to deal with people who oh, really um, seriously, I see. Are, are creating uh, problems from a criminal perspective, mm -hmm. um, albeit because of their drug use. Mm -hmm. um, I think there has to be a combination approach, if you will, of treatment and effective law enforcement. I see. We're down to our last 30 seconds or so. What do you do in your spare time for relaxation? Uh, I am an avid sports fan. I enjoy playing tennis, although I must admit that I haven't had as much time to play tennis as I would have liked. Mm -hmm. um, I am hopeful that I will uh, change things in, in that regard. I also sing in my alumni gospel choir uh -huh. um, from Swarthmore. So uh, periodically we go up to Swarthmore for rehearsals and have concerts in various places. Um, on the East Coast, usually, we traveled to St. Thomas last year and did some concerts down mm -hmm. there. So those are two of the things I enjoy doing. Obviously, I have a, a, a nice circle of friends with whom I do a variety of things here in the District of Columbia. Well, great. It's been wonderful talking to you, and good luck in your new position. Thank you very much. A pleasure has been mine, and I enjoyed it very much. My pleasure. That's Carib Nation for today. Join us for another of our interesting sessions with another interesting individual from the Caribbean. Until next time, I'm Doris Dean. Remember to check our website, www.caribnationtv.com. <laughs>